Well, welcome to our Christmas Eve service for December 24th, 2020. And as always, we're so glad that you are joining us for worship this evening. Uh, as I look out across our virtually empty sanctuary, it is a little bit discouraging, a little bit disheartening that we have to worship in this way tonight. Uh, normally, in front of me, uh, every pew, every seat would be filled, and we have a full house, and we love our Christmas Eve services, but this year, uh, we know that that just can't be, so we are glad that you're worshiping with us in this way, and we pray that this time of worship be a blessing to you, because on this Christmas Eve, we can count it in mere hours. The labor pains are about to begin. That light is about to shine forth in the darkness, and the darkness, we are told, will never overcome it. We come here knowing that soon a baby will be born. A baby that will change our lives and change our world forever. God is about to break into our existence in a way that we never expected, in a way that we almost miss. God sneaks into our world as a baby because he wanted to come and save us from our sins and our iniquities. On this night, the holiest night, we come with the shepherds stunned and amazed. On this night, this holy night, we come with Mary and Joseph, whose hopes and dreams were all gathered in this infant, this Christ child. On this night, we come with all of those who were gathered in that stable, in that barn, around that manger that night. And we bring our hopes and our dreams with it. On this night, we light candles. And on this night, we sing carols. And we rejoice with the angelic messengers who appeared to those shepherds in that field. And they brought good tidings of great joy for all people. So I invite you to come tonight. Prepare your hearts and your minds for worship and come and worship this newborn king. Let us pray. Gracious God, on this holy night, you gave us your son, the Lord of the universe, wrapped in swaddling clothes, the savior of all of us, lying in a manger. On this holy night, draw us into the mystery of your love. Join our voices with the heavenly host that we may sing your glory on high. Give us a place among the shepherds that we might find the one for whom we have waited so long. Jesus Christ, your word made flesh, who lives and reigns with you in the splendor of eternal light. On this Christmas Eve, as the light of your word penetrates our hearts, as we are reminded of the gift of life and faith, as the glories of the heavenly host are echoed in our church and in our homes, we open ourselves up to your spirit and give you thanks. We are grateful, Lord Jesus, that your story has become our story, and we celebrate your birth. God of birth, God of light, in this time of song and prayer and silence, reawaken in us the awe of Christmas. As we hear again the story of a young woman and a surprising visitor, remind us that we are called to respond to you in unexpected ways. And when we leave this place, and when we leave this time of worship in our homes, may we be willing to sing praises for a young woman who said yes and the birth that we prepare to celebrate. God with us, Emmanuel, as we wait for the dawning of Christmas Day. As our souls long for your presence among us, let us remember Bethlehem in the midst of our celebrations. Our world today is much the same, still occupied, still a place of division, still a place of great fear and great anxiety, still a place of prejudice, prejudice and repression still a place in deep need of your hope, your peace, your joy, and your love. Come among us tonight, O Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And now let us sing together the first Noel.
Behold, I bring you good news of great joy, for to you is born in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Jesus has arrived in grace and mystery, renewing faded hopes and announcing peace to a weary world. Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom God favors. Jesus comes among us in power and glory inspiring joy and calling us to lives that are full of God's love. Jesus, the light of the world, is born. Let Christ's light shine in the darkest corners of our lives. Let Christ's life shine in the darkest corners of our world. God is with us. Let us pray. God of grace and glory, as we celebrate this Christmas, transform our hearts and our lives so that your good news is not an old story, but a fresh truth lived out every day through the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. Isaiah chapter 9, 2-7 The people walking in darkness have seen a great light, on those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as the day in Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke, the burdens then, the bar across the shoulders, the rod of the oppressor, every warrior a boot used in battle, Every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government, the peace there will be no end, and he will reign on David's throne, and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The seal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this.
Hi guys, just want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas, especially my friends that are maybe not at home. For instance, Roy Norton, well, he's at home at his place, and Day Warren, and there's lots of others that we should think of this time of year. Merry Christmas. From the book of Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, we learn of the birth of Jesus. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quinius, the governor of Assyria, was in charge, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger. There was no room for them at the inn.
From the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 8 to 20. And there were angels living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. And while they were there, it came time for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in cloths, and she laid him in a manger, because there is no room for him in the inn. You see, Caesar Augustus has issued a decree that everyone would go back to their hometowns for the census. And so Mary and Joseph make the long trek back to Bethlehem. And it is there that this baby was born. It is there that this baby that was born would change the world as we know it forever. You see, God had this messy plan. He was going to send his son to save the world. He was going to send himself. And where does the God of the universe, where does the God of the universe send the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? To Jerusalem? No. To Rome, perhaps? No. 
to Bethlehem, the backwaters of Bethlehem, to a barn, to a stable, to a manger. That is where this king would be born. And it was messy. I mean, there, there was hay and there was dirt and there was dust and there was animals and there was animal stuff. It was a messy place, certainly not fit for a king to be born. And yet, this is where God chose to send himself to come into our world. And we ask ourselves, why? Why would God choose a place like this? Why would God send his son to a barn, to a stable to be born? Well, we're not sure. We don't have the answers to those questions. But the prophet Isaiah reminds us that our ways are not God's ways and God's ways are not our ways. And God's thoughts are not our thoughts, and our thoughts are not God's thoughts. And that same prophet Isaiah, 400 years before Jesus was ever born, said, we are like sheep who have gone astray, each to our own way. And Jesus has come to be the shepherd. You see, the shepherd was coming to save the world. The shepherd was coming to lead the sheep back home. And Jesus lived where we live, because that's what shepherds do. Jesus ate what we ate. Jesus slept where we sleep, because that's what shepherds do. It's an amazing story, an incredible story. This story of the God who owns a thousand cattle and a thousand hills decides to send his one and only son to a stable to be born for us. And every time we hear this story, we change the details sometimes, we highlight some, and we ignore others, and we even not highlight them as much as others. Every time we tell this story, every year, we tell it from a different perspective. Even the four Gospels tell, give four different accounts of the birth of Christ. The Gospel of Matthew, as we looked at on Sunday morning, focuses on Joseph, and focuses on the Magi coming from the East. The Gospel of Luke is the longest account and the most beautifully written and the one that we go to every Christmas Eve and every Christmas Day. The one where he talks about Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the star in the sky and the angels singing to them and bringing them that good news of great joy. And then the Gospel of Mark doesn't mention Jesus' birth at all. In fact, it focuses on Jesus' baptism many years later. The Gospel of John, it talks about the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us, the word being Jesus Christ himself. And he talks about this light that is coming into our world, this light that the darkness will never overcome. So even all the four gospel writers tell the same story in different ways. And we do that with the stories of our life too. When we talk about trips we've been on or vacations we've been on, we highlight certain details that we think are important to the story the people we were with, where we visited, where we stayed, what we ate. And we, we tell all those details of the story. And in the Christmas story, we're not even told the name of the inn. What was the name of the inn in the Christmas story in the Gospel of Luke? Was it the Bethlehem Hotel? Was it the Road to Nazareth Convention Center? Was it the Holiday Inn? Who knows? All we know is that there is no room for Mary and Joseph. And was it a five-star hotel? No, the Bible tells us it was a one-star hotel. And this is where Jesus came to be born in a stable in a manger. And it's an incredible story, really, when we think about the fact that God chose Mary, a young girl, and Joseph, a young man, both of them teenagers, both of them confused about this incredible story that God would be born of Mary and come to be one of us. This king was coming into our world, but it's such a strange throne room. There's no tapestries on the windows. There's no royal vestments or robes. There's no king's court, no fanfare, no golden scepter. In fact, the infant king was probably grasping a rattle made of olive wood. And it was messy. This is the plan that God had to come into our world in this royal place that we would not confuse with royalty, this humble place where Jesus was born. And we're told 
that Jesus came here to save us from our iniquities, to save us from our sins. And he came in a way that Bethlehem missed it. He snuck into our world almost unnoticed. And I want to bring you back to that morning after that night in Bethlehem. And Bethlehem rose to life a little earlier than usual that morning. The streets began to get busy with people. Vendors pushed their carts to the corner to sell their wares. Shop owners opened their shops a little early that morning. Children were awakened by the dogs barking in the streets. And donkeys were pulling wooden carts rattling up and down the avenue. And the innkeeper was probably up before most. He had had a long night. And he was about to have a very long day. And I wonder what the conversation around the breakfast table at the innkeeper's house was that morning. Did he talk to his wife about that young couple that came to their door late last night? The ones that they had to turn away because there was no room? How did that conversation go? Did they talk about how this young woman was so obviously pregnant? Did they talk, did they talk about how they rejected them and sent them off to a stable? If the topic was raised, it was only raised. It was never discussed. There was too much to do. There was bread to make, chores to do, things to do in town that day. And so they went on about their business. And if someone had happened to stop by the stable that morning, and peer inside and take a look. What a peculiar scene they would have seen. Shepherds huddled in a corner, bewildered, perplexed, confused, but most certainly amazed. And then if you shift your gaze from the shepherds and you move it over a little bit further, you're gonna see Joseph, this young boy, leaning against the wall with his eyes barely open, barely able to keep them open, if anyone's dozing, it should be Joseph, because they had such a long trek to get here. And then you shift it from Joseph to Mary. And there is this young mother. She's wide awake. And the pain of last night's birth has given way to the wonderment of today. And she holds her newborn baby in her arms, and she looks into his face. And when she does that, she believes she is looking into the face of God. She doesn't understand it all. Joseph doesn't understand it, but they believe. Mary believed first and then told Joseph, and Joseph wasn't sure what to do. As we talked about on Sunday, Joseph was thinking about quietly divorcing her, but then the angel said, no, believe her unbelievable story, and everything's going to work out. And so Joseph believed, and Mary believed. And Mary, can you see her reaching down with her hand and caressing the cheek of her newborn baby? And whispering a question, how long was your journey, little one? Because she knows that this baby has overseen the galaxies and the stars and the universe. She knows that somehow this is the Son of God that she is holding in her arms. And that's the amazing part of this entire story, that God uses ordinary people like that to do extraordinary things on that extraordinary night. And Bethlehem missed it. They went on about their day. They went on about their lives. And they missed the beauty that was coming into their midst in their own backyard. And it's an amazing story that they missed this thing. This majesty that came into the middle of the mundane. This holiness that came in the middle of animals and hay in a barn. Divinity had come into our world on the floor of a stable through the womb of a young girl in the presence of a young carpenter. And Bethlehem missed it. But are we any different? I think we might have missed it too. I think we miss all sorts of beauty in our lives. I think we miss all sorts of ways God is working in our lives. And Bethlehem missed it not because of any evil or malice, simply because they weren't looking. They weren't expecting God to show up that night. There's a story about a man who was playing violin in the subway station in Washington, D.C. And he played for 45 minutes in that subway station and the busy commuters passed him. Thousands of commuters walked by and not many stopped to listen. One man stopped for 30 seconds, leaned against the wall and listened for a few moments and then looked at his watch and knew he had to be somewhere else, so he rushed on. 
Another lady rushed past without even looking, dropped $20 into the violin case without even breaking stride. Another man stopped just for half a second, turned his head and kept going. One little boy, a six-year-old boy, stopped and stood and listened for over three minutes in amazement to this music until his mother nudged him on and took his hand and led him away. And he looked, kept looking back to see this amazing beauty that was in their midst that everybody was missing. And what we didn't know and what they didn't know at that time was that the person who was playing that violin in that subway station was Joshua Bell, one of the premier musicians in the world, one of the premier violinists in the world. And he was playing one of Bach's most intricate, difficult pieces to play. And he was playing it on a violin worth three and a half million dollars. In fact, Joshua Bell had sold out a theater in Boston where the average seat was a hundred dollars the night before. And it was an experiment to see how many people would notice beauty in their midst. And most people missed it. That's what happened in Bethlehem on that night. People missed it because they were busy doing other things. So I'm going to encourage you this Christmas in this season to slow down, to open your eyes, and to see the world through the eyes of faith and not through our own eyes. And you'll be amazed at what you see. You'll begin to see the beauty around you. You'll begin to see God working in unexpected places. And you'll begin to see the promises of Advent. There will be hope even in the midst of despair. There will be peace even in the midst of turmoil. There will be joy even in the midst of suffering. There will be love even in the midst of hate. That's the promise of Advent, that's the promise of Christmas, and that's the promise that Jesus gave us when he came to us on that unforgettable night. And he did come to get messy. He came to this messy world with this messy plan, and thank God he did, because what a mess we'd be in if he didn't. I pray that you have a, st a strong and safe Christmas and a good Christmas with all of your family as much as we can do this year. It's a different year, it's a difficult year, but we pray that you would stay well and stay safe. And I encourage you to open your eyes and look around, and you'll see God at work in our midst. And you'll find that long-awaited hope you've been waiting for. You'll find that long-awaited peace that your heart has been yearning for. You'll find that joy, which doesn't depend on our circumstances. And you'll find that love which is unconditional and amazing and for all people. Amen. Oh, come.
Let us turn our hearts and our minds toward God in prayer. Let us pray. God of unimaginable love, on the first Christmas you became one of us. We celebrate your love for every person in every place and in every time. God of all humanity, you offered your peace to anyone who would be satisfied with your presence. We celebrate the peace that you bring and accept your commission to share that peace with the world around us. God of the shepherds, you announced your arrival among us to the poorest, to the most humble, to those who are willing to listen. We celebrate your good news to each of us and to everyone right here where we are tonight. God of the manger, you came to us through your son in a small and simple place. We celebrate your presence with us tonight in this small place, in our homes, wherever we find ourselves, made holy by your being in it. God of deliverance, you came to be one of us in order to deliver us. We celebrate your protection and mercy toward all who are sick or in trouble or in, who are in need of your touch. God of new birth, when you became as we are, you opened yourself to each one of us, no matter who we are, no matter what we are, no matter where we are. God, this is a season for miracles, and we pray for one for our world today. Where there is sorrow, we pray for your grace to light that darkness. Where there is despair, we pray for your hope. Where there is hatred, we pray for your forgiveness. Where there is war and violence, we pray for your love to light that darkness. Where there is confusion, we pray for your peace. Where there is injustice, we pray for your courage to light that darkness. Where there is fear and anxiety about an unknown future, we pray for your joy even in the midst of that despair. Give us courage to be your people, to show your love, your grace, your mercy, and your peace. To be part of your transformation of our world until the day when the baby whose birth we celebrate tonight will come again in peace. Lord, we pray all of this in the strong name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. And now let us sing together, Silent Night.
We thank you so much for joining us for our worship service for this Christmas Eve this evening, and we thank all of those who participated tonight for their reading, for their singing, and what they brought to our worship time this evening. And we pray that each of you will have a safe Christmas, a blessed Christmas. Uh, we would encourage you to connect with your family, even if you can't be together in person, to connect with them in whatever way you can. And a reminder that we are taking the next two Sundays off. We're going to be taking a break. And we will be back with our regular worship services online on January 10. And uh, we uh, hope that you will join us at that time. And from here, we pray that you will go in the hope of Advent and the peace which passes all understanding. We pray that you'll go in the joy of the season and the love that is for all people. May each of you go now in peace and in the love of Christ. Amen. And stay safe, stay well, and stay connected. <laughs>